Greetings to everyone. Is everyone here now? Fantastic. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Jan. I'm the managing director of LA Louver. Thank you all for joining us today for this very special online conversation. One of the many virtual programs we have hosted throughout LA Louver's ongoing 45 at 45 anniversary group exhibition. I'd like to start with a tiny bit of housekeeping. Um, although we've extended our 45 at 45 show through January 30th, we have suspended our online appointment system due to the current volume of COVID-19 cases affecting Southern California and out of concern for the health and safety of our colleagues, visitors, and community. All of us at LA Louvre would like to take this moment to express our sincere gratitude to the frontline and essential workers that are bearing the greatest burden of the pandemic at this time. That stated, if you have any questions about our 45 at 45 group exhibition or any of the artists in the show or that Ellie Louver represents, please feel free to call us or email us at the gallery directly and our details are on our website, ellielouver.com. In many ways, our 45 at 45 exhibition has allowed us to be both retrospective and introspective at the same time, providing an opportunity to look back through the gallery's history and to focus on many artists we've had the distinct privilege of working with for more than four decades. However, 45 at 45 has also allowed us to express our curiosity and respect for artists with whom we have not had prior engagement. And we've been so appreciative for their participation and contributions to celebrate our current moment. So we're excited that four artists in both of these camps are with us today, Koshin Finley, Gajin Fujita, Gabriela Sanchez, and Patrick Martinez. Given the challenges and hardships over the last year, and indeed in these first very long days of 2021, we felt we wanted to look distinctly forward to the future and to host a conversation trained on vision and hope ahead. Instead of looking solely through 45 years in the past, we thought it would be interesting to meditate on what art and life could look like in Los Angeles 45 years from now. As such, we are thrilled today to host the last of our Zoom events for 45 at 45 and to consider the concept of LA futurism. For this, we have invited this particular group of esteemed artists, all of whom are native Los Angelinos and who live in, create from, and contribute to the identity of our extraordinarily unique city. Just a technical note, if you have any questions you'd like to submit to the panel, please pop them into the Q&A and we will address them right after the conversation. To steer what we know will be a fascinating discussion about their work and their visions of and for Los Angeles, we are so honored to be joined by our moderator today, Chris Kuramitsu. Chris Kuramitsu is Deputy Director and Head of Program for the Mistake Room in Los Angeles, where she has organized exhibitions and programs over the past few years, such as Matsumi Kanemitsu, Metamorphic Effects, Sao Fei, Shadow Plays, Carlos Amorales, a film trilogy, a Tender Spot, Sky Hopinka, and Karabing Film Collective, Susa Atar Isthmus, Gael Schwan, Temple of Love, Adorable, and Where the Sea Remembers. As an independent curator, she has organized exhibitions for institutions such as LAX Art, the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena, Instituto Cervantes in Madrid, Paramo in Guadalajara, and the Japanese American National Museum, Los Angeles, in addition to managing private art collections. Most recently, she launched the Candlewood Arts Festival, a temporary public exhibition project for the Under the Sun Foundation in the Anza Borrego Desert. Her previous posts include Associate Director for Artists, Programs Director at Creative Link for the Arts in New York, Curator for the Collections of Eileen and Peter Norton and the Collection of Eileen Harris Norton, and the Arts Programs Director for the Peter Norton Family Foundation. She currently lives and works in LA. Chris, thank you so much for being here and thank you for introducing the four artists with us today and kicking off what will be sure to be a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Lisa. And um, thank you to LA Louver and everyone at the gallery for organizing this conversation and providing uh, a platform for all of us to explore together. Um, especially thanks to the four incredible artists that have joined us today. Um, and uh, to all of you out there in the audience, thank you for sharing some of your afternoon with us. Um, I wanted to first open by acknowledging um, that we are speaking to you from different locations across Los Angeles, um, from the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Tongva, Tata Viam, and Chumash peoples. And um, we pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and future. Um, and, uh, you know, 
it's especially important to to state this and to begin this way because we are talking about visions for you know a future of Los Angeles um, for for this place that uh, we all love and hold so dear and we need to kind of acknowledge that lineage as a as a foundation for it. Um, so I think first I'll just um, quickly introduce the the uh, four incredible artists that we have with us. Um, I'll read a little bit of, of uh, some bio for, for each of them, and then we can kind of get started with our conversation. Um, so uh, starting with Koshin Finley, LA native and current resident, uh, Koshin Finley. Grew up surrounded by art and creativity, raised by parents who are fashion designers. Um, he went on to earn a BFA from Otis College of Art and Design. Uh, he's known for creating portraits that convey the power and beauty of his subjects, um, as well as a really wonderful sense of intimacy and personal connection um, um, with, the, with the sitters. Uh, Finley's developed a practice that's become widely recognized by galleries and institutions in LA and uh, beyond. And he's currently preparing for group exhibitions um, at two major galleries in, in 2021. Um, in March at Jeffrey Deitch in uh, LA, and in September at Jack Shaman at the school in, in upstate New York. Um, Gajin Fujita grew up in Boyle Heights and is the son of an artist and an art conservator, um, both from Japan. And Gajin was steeped in, um, in art from an early age and developed and uh, grew in uh, his love for his native Los Angeles as well. Um, his paintings incorporate the visual language of graffiti, um, traditional iconography of Edo period woodblock prints, um, and a myriad of symbols of, of West Coast culture and, and Los Angeles in particular. Um, he uh, also received a degree from Otis um, College of Art and Design uh, and <laughs> um, also earned a, an MFA from the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. And you can find his work in institutional collections worldwide, um, including at the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney, LA County Museum of Art, and the Met in New York, among many others. Um, Patrick Martinez hails from the San Gabriel Valley and has lived and worked in LA throughout his career. Um, and his uh, rooted experience of place finds its way into all of his work. Um, he maintains a, a diverse practice, creating kind of mixed media landscapes with paint, ceramic, neon, found materials, um, and uh, incorporating references to uh, everyday objects like, you know, celebratory birthday cakes and school folders, among other things, um, to call attention to history's overlooked figures um, and spaces and the injustices that come from those erasures. Uh, he holds a BFA from Art Center College of Art and Design and in, in Pasadena. And his work also has been uh, widely internationally and domestically um, on display in venues, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, National Portrait Gallery, and um, many, many others. Uh, his work is um, uh, represented in um, museum collections from coast to coast as well. Um, this year, Patrick will participate in the Rauschenberg Residency um, on Captiva Island and um, will uh, have an exhibition at the Tucson Museum of Art in Arizona. And finally, Gabriela Sanchez uh, is a Los Angeles-based uh, cross-disciplinary artist uh, whose work is rooted in painting and the exploration of social symbols. Uh, she's worked for several years um, as a full-time graphic designer on projects um, with uh, uh, corporations like Nike and Toyota and, and other clients. Um, she began exhibiting her paintings and works on paper in 2016, and her work has been exhibited at commercial galleries and museums across the country. Um, her work is also included in many notable collections, 
um, across the US. Um, and um, Gabriella received a BFA from Point Loma Nazarene University in San Diego. So thank you all um, for joining us. Um, and I wanted to just start um, today uh, thinking about, um, you know, just kind of starting us from the, the focus of talking about your work and grounding it in your work. Um, to kind of come up with a sort of collective vision for a future that is really, um, you know, rooted in Los Angeles, where all of us live and work. Um, you know, I was I was excited to be here with you because, first of all, I'm like a, a huge fan of all of your work, um, but I also think each of you, in the way that you work and the kind of work that you do. Um, will have a lot to contribute about a conversation about how we can kind of move forward into um, into the future and, and shape a Los Angeles, you know, that, that looks a little different, that acts a little differently, and is for um, uh, a lot of, um, you know, that, that is for uh, an expanded um, sense of community, let's just say. Um, and I think, you know, it sounds a little bit um, utopian and a little bit idealistic, especially at this, you know, I have to acknowledge the, the sort of point in history where we are, um, you know, just coming out of essentially what was essentially a coup attempt <laughs> at, uh, and, and just uh, incredible threats to, you know, the very state of democracy in the U.S., um, you know, and obviously we're in the midst of an incredible um, crisis moment. Uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, kind of the, the epicenter seems to be at, um, in right where we are in LA County um, for, you know, and the world is, is kind of looking at us um, at, at this point. Um, and all of it is, uh, is sort of exacerbated and underscored by, you know, really deepening fault lines um, around yeah. racial injustice in, in the United States. Um, but I think also it's really at the point of all of this um, almost breakdown of, of these social and cultural systems where we can, can really begin to start uh, imagining something different and building something else. And, you know, hopefully we can, we can kind of focus um, our, our thoughts and our energies in, in that direction. So, you know, to, to just start off with all of you, um, can you, um, I, I would like to just ground our conversation in your work. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking of, of uh, your work in response to Los Angeles as not only a physical space, but also a very complicated mix of, of relationships and communities that, that actually make up and sustain that space. Um, so, uh, you know, just wanted to throw out there the question of, of your work and how it relates to um, Los Angeles and this place where you live and, and you know, kind of inhabit. And, and um, uh, I don't know who wants to, maybe one of you can begin with that. And we can talk about, you know, the place, um, who the communities are that sustain you in that place and, and how they play into the work that you make. <laughs> so maybe, what about, I'll start. yeah? Okay. I'll, I'll take the baton. Excellent, um, thank you. Yeah, it, it, I mean, you said a lot there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'll try to attend to as much as I can. Um, but yeah, first of all, thank you guys for being here. It's a pleasure to talk to all of you and thank you for all the participants who are here watching. Um, yeah, I mean, my work is, is so specifically LA. You know, all of the people who feature, who are featured in my work are here, are here. You know, most of them born and raised here. I'm born and raised here. Um, and there's like a specific just sort of, I don't know, sort of aura, sort of thing that like when you see someone, you feel you just like kind of know. Um, and it's, it's, it's usually like what gravitates me to the people that I know and the people that I, you know, are, are featured in my works. And um, it's a really powerful thing that, I get to create my artworks in the way that I do and being able to have conversations with my friends, 
you know, sometimes hour or two hours before I actually make the work and then getting into, um, thank you for putting that up, and then getting into actually photographing them, you know, on, on medium format film and then, you know, working onto the artwork. And, you know, parts of what you'll see in the artworks are, are text there and it's actually poetry that I'm writing based off my experience with them and based off stories that they've shared with me. Uh, this one in particular is, is a photo of um, Alana and Lena on, the, on, their, sort of, on their terrace of, um, of their home in, in Glendale. And um, yeah, like it's very sort of, this almost feels like an a, a, a old noir that like, you know, Humphrey Bogart or somebody would be in, you know, some old Hollywood thing. Um, but it's, it's really important to me to capture people in this way, in a way that like they're here, but they've always been here um, and, and immortalizing them in this way. And especially now, um, you know, LA, I think it's captured usually as like sort of has this like underbelly or like this sort of haze or this like dark sort of cloud under like this thing that's supposed to be like glamorous and beautiful. But in the work that I'm really trying to make now, I think especially since quarantine, has really been challenging myself to make work that I haven't really been seeing, you know, pretty much my whole life, you know, where in LA or even just in the world of art, but creating artworks that are based from love, you know, and like capturing two lovers in the sun, you know, that's a lot of the series that I'm working on now. And this was one of the first ones. And one, like you said, Chris, like it's kind of utopian. It's kind of like this, you know sort of thing that it's like kind of like oh what, what are we sort of doing here but like that this is how I participate in the world this is what I'm giving to the world this is the artwork that I want to see um, and that I, I want to be the one who makes it you know I want to be the one who captures you know lovers in the sun and being able to to show love together and that there's no quarrel you know usually when lovers are shown in a movie or an artwork there in some battle or some duality of something but it's I think it's such a beautiful thing to see like when you can just have two people here just being together and being present together and being captured in that way um, and then we can go for the tulips for art and painting um, mm -hmm. which is another painting that I started um, in quarantine I think this one was about like April um, and really like at the beginning of quarantine, just thinking about like what I saw, like what, what was out there. I started painting, you know, flowers that I photographed on my walks. I, then I, I brought these specific tulips home to my girlfriend because, you know, she was going to come over and I was like, oh, I'm at the flower shop. I'll get her some tulips. And I brought these home and I was, I was just so fascinated with them. I was just so fascinated with the idea of what flowers are for and how you give them to somebody to, that they symbolize something. These mm -hmm. ones in particular, I gave them to, to, to symbolize my love, to, to put that forward and like to actually have the physical manifestation of these tulips there. And then thinking about like, okay, what if I photographed these and then and created an artwork from them and then painted them? Like that symbolism that originally started is now here and it's now in a, a 60 by 48 artwork and that it can be shown digitally everywhere. It can be shown physically everywhere, but it, the, it is now manifested in this way. And that this is something I can also give to somebody. Um, mm -hmm. This one in particular was a commission I did um, for some dear friends of mine. Um, this Tulips for Arden, Arden is their daughter. Mm -hmm. And um, when I dropped off the painting, she she didn't even know what the title was, but she goes, oh my God, those are so beautiful. Are those for me? And then I go, oh, yeah, of course they're for you. And like her face just like lit up. And like, that was like, okay, I, this, this works. This is an option. This is not only, an, it's, it's, it's a reality that you could encase this feeling and that you can give it to somebody through artworks and that somebody can feel that way and that that's possible through art. And so she's seven. So she now knows what the, that this is ha can happen from seven and like what happens when she gets to 30 and like she knows that art can give her this so mm -hmm. that is really the the sort of crux of my work now is is how do I investigate that how do I showcase more people in love how do I 
how do I make this something that art can give and how do I sort of encapsulate um, feelings and emotions and be able to not only give that to people, um, but to, to just sort of have that be in the aura of the work. And so specifically in, in that one on the tulips, um, I see Bob mm -hmm. and Anna asked the question. I didn't see the whole question, but I, I, I saw it was about text. Um, so that is a, a poem that I wrote to Arden um, that is actually written underneath the, the oil paint. So over time, over like about a month or so, that text actually comes through the top and beats through the oil paint. Mm -hmm. And so it, it sort of creates this sort of woven kind of texture that is actually underneath the paint that when you see it, it, it actually comes up and so you can see the text in person. Um, and the text is in all my works and it's important to me because it's not necessarily legible and it's not important, it's not important for it to be read, but it's important for it to be felt. Mm -hmm. um, and that someone was here, you know, this painting didn't just happen. Someone wrote this to somebody for something. Um, and that to me is important in having another art form in there in poetry, you know, poetry and photography and drawing and, and painting is all right. sort of in this. And it's really, uh, it's an artwork, you know, and it, it's, it's so, it's even in that word, it's so much bigger than that word. Yeah, I, I always am so, um, every time I see your work, I'm always so moved by the sort of intimacy of it, mm -hmm. even when they're these like large portraits, yeah. um, you know, they're sort of monumental, but they're also mm -hmm. intimate at the same mm -hmm. time. Um, and, and I think this relationship um, that you, uh, that is the sort of genesis of the work is, is something really, um, it, it's, it's uh, felt and it's, it's something really, um, meaningful in terms of the way that you kind of understand how your artwork is sort of working in the world and what it's what it's for and what it does so um i think that's really really beautiful and i think in the same way um you know it, it the, this kind of relationship you have with your your subjects i think is really uh, quite interesting that comes through in the the painting but also also the text um and I think, you know, like with Gajin, your work, I think the text works in an entirely, mm. uh, entirely different way. Um, but mm. I thought maybe Gajin, you could talk a little bit about, about your work and um, its sort of relationship to, uh, to the city and the kind of relationship that you have with different communities in the city as well. Mm -hmm. um... Yeah, the idea of using text and graffiti has definitely um, given me an opportunity to seek uh, many sort of subcultural things and ideas in the city while I, you know, while I was growing up in the city. Mm -hmm. of LA and uh, graffiti is one of them. I, I, I look at graffiti like a subculture. When I started doing graffiti in LA, it was like in the infancy, in the mm -hmm. early 80s, yeah. um, when hip hop was making its mark. And, um, you know, uh, back then we didn't have cell phones and communication wasn't this rapid, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, you, you had to, you had to be out there, <laughs> and um, uh, the graffiti pieces were like messages that you left behind. Even though there were like your alias and your names, uh -huh. it, your street names that you uh, tagged and uh, hit up, but um, it was through through graffiti, I think, that I I met. Um, some of my more um, longtime friends that yeah. I still have today, um, and yeah, uh, and I graffiti think like rooted me to this city. Uh, it yeah. got me out and, and about, uh, you know, going across town from East Side to the West Side. Mm -hmm. uh, going to go paint from Belmont to like Venice Beach mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, uh, that's, that's a, 
that's a huge part of my community i think yeah, uh, yeah it's uh, like your relation your spatial relationship to the city is is almost like it's through graffiti right and and you know also, ge geographically i was able to sort of scope out places that people would never dare to go go to or you know only graffiti artists would venture into these mm -hmm. grimy <laughs> ends and corners of the city i guess you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i think the other thing that's kind of interesting is this you know kind of continuing relationship that you have with your long time, you know, like you say, your yeah. long time's friends and they're, um, they sort of participate in your paintings. And yeah, so, so yeah, that's, that's, and that's like a huge part mm -hmm. of um, my work um, and one of the layers and one of the foundational layers or primary layers of uh, my paintings. And as you see up in, up in this, um, Mm -hmm. Invincible Kings of this Mad Mad World painting. Um, there are probably like 12, 11 to 12 uh, graffiti artist friends, uh, mm -hmm. people from uh, the crew that I belong to. Um, mostly, it, it, you know, it's a lot of the times it's um, uh, the usual suspects that come out and paint for me. And I, I don't want to be biased or anything, but yeah, I, I, I tend to um, ask uh, some of the mm -hmm. friends that I, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I shouldn't call it favoritism, but it's mm -hmm. um, I favor them more than others, you know. But yeah, um, yeah. So they, yeah. So that's that's like one of the initial. Um, sort of the way you uh, start some of these like early stages of this, of, of the painting process is having right. your friends come in and yeah. like. And uh, that's, and you know, their tags I think are like um, not only messages, but uh, uh, tags that will, might not be um, unseen. Um, out in the streets, you know. Um, yeah, so and very recognizable ones too. <laughs> yeah, and so you know, I I, I ask people like Defer, uh, Big Sleeps, Prime. You know, these guys are like uh, um, super uh, legendary, I guess, in the graffiti LA graffiti world. Mm -hmm. And I just feel that's like a huge uh, part of the language that I'm building, mm -hmm. uh, LA sort of language. Um, and it's very rooted uh, to the city, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And maybe here, Gabriella, uh -huh. you could kind of jump in as well, um, you know, speaking about kind of language and text and relationship to the city, because I think, um, text and lettering and even you know kind of graphics and fonts and and all of that mm -hmm. are play into a really um uh, uh, a sort of very subtle and nuanced um uh uh kind of message about the city and and about you know it's different kind of communities and audiences um so maybe you could talk a little bit about words and language and text in your work too yeah um yeah, I think uh, I really like my process really starts a lot with like writing and reading. Um, but I'm not even talking about like just reading art books, like any type of book um, mm. that just like I read a lot of sci fi, I read a lot of fantasy, I also read a lot of art theory, critical race theory, like also books that have nothing to do with anything, <laughs> you know, that are just like it's just. Um, I've always been really big into escapism and mm -hmm. any form of art has always been that for me. Movies, um, design, painting, drawing, reading, like I think uh, as a kid that was really like my solace and um, so now 
that I paint, it's kind of like a way for me to ground myself into what I'm doing, what I'm trying to do, um, or just a free flow of thoughts. Like I have Google Docs where I'm just writing notes to myself, you know, of like, this is, um, this is just a sentence that really encapsulates what I'm feeling. Sometimes I'll even just like listen to music and just like write whatever kind of comes. And so um, I'll just like kind of keep this like this journal diary, like personal essay, poetry, just long ass Google doc. Mm -hmm. um, and as I'm painting and kind of ruminating about everything that I'm kind of like processing at the time. And so a lot of times, the words in my paintings will mm -hmm. come or my work in general will come from these writings that sometimes are samples from other texts that I've been tapping into or revisiting. Um, and sometimes they're word pairings or fragments of sentences that connect in um, larger like personal essays that are just for myself really. But um, I feel like uh, express a community or like wider access point for people through mm -hmm. like the words that you're seeing right now like fine line um I've written a lot I've written that a lot in my like personal google doc essays um mm -hmm. and I keep coming back to it and like playing with it in different font types to see how it changes um and I think it really comes from my time as a graphic designer as well mm -hmm. um because you, I've worked for under brand guides. Um, and so you get to see how, um, like what kind of types are standardized as being universal and which aren't and what that really means. And uh -huh. just in the way that um, visual and personal aesthetics can be either um, used as a form of self-protection, self-armament, or if it's taken out of a community, it's often used um, for monetary gain that doesn't come back to the community or used yeah. for um, a means of criminalization or stigma. Um, and so is language and so is, um, so is speech. And so like marrying visual language with literal language um, is very interesting to me. Um, and even like mixing in my own little writings in like, mm -hmm. I feel like I don't even know what my real handwriting is, you know, cause it's always changing. It's always just depends in like what mood I'm in. And it's always kind of been that way. I've always, um, I've always in school, I was always um, changing up my handwriting mm -hmm. because it was like a form of um, like preserving my own identity in these very academic spaces that were pretty hostile mm -hmm. to me um mm -hmm. and I still do that in my work you'll see like a bunch of my handwriting that could look different depending on um the mood what I'm trying to evoke mm -hmm. um yeah and also it obviously connects very directly to what I've seen around the city like all of these fonts all of these um, all of these writings and tags, it's very much influenced from my time growing up in LA and living in LA and working in LA as a graphic designer, mm -hmm. um, but also just growing up in, in the neighborhoods that I did and seeing, getting inspiration um, from my own personal aesthetic, my own style, and from that isn't a shared, that is often taps into a shared aesthetic of a wider community um, mm -hmm. that is very rooted in um, the Latinx community, but also very rooted in low income communities in LA that um, cross many racial lines. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as my time as a designer, I really saw how a lot of our aesthetic choices were ripped and uh -huh. um, compressed so that yeah. it didn't acknowledge the roots, you know? And I think that even happens in 
or that definitely happens in the art world as well, you know, like there's many um, painters who find inspiration from sign painters, but very often um, or very rarely do those same works really acknowledge who's actually doing that mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was, that was, I, I am glad that you sort of brought in the sort of the economics behind the aesthetics and how that, how it yeah. travels, how those, how the text and um, the like sort of visual language travels in a, in a mm -hmm. really, um, you know, sometimes problematic way, um, you know, between universes and communities, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, uh, Patrick, maybe you can also speak a little bit to, to mm -hmm. that about your kind of, um, your uh, engagement with the textual language and visual language um, that that uh, you know kind of informs your neon signs and and other sort of landscape paintings that you that you make yeah I mean um, like I was telling you earlier like maybe a few mm -hmm. days ago Chris um, I was mm -hmm. thinking a lot about the past uh, during um, you know kind of uh, shelter in place and yeah. uh, I've always been thinking about the past and um, I was on another um, panel discussion at the uh, museo and a thought came up when I was in middle school. Um, I went to a pretty good uh, elementary school, really a solid, um, pretty happy uh, middle school came. I was 11 years old. There was race riots, black crap mm -hmm. going at it. And that was my introduction, you know, to kind of the, the people and the landscape. And uh, a year, that year I think was the uprising the, mm -hmm. the 92 uprising so that was like kind of my introduction to like seeing uh, the land and then I was uh, right right during that time I was already involved in graffiti so like uh, Jean was saying it, it forced mm -hmm. someone me to go out as a little 11 12 year old kid to go check out and investigate uh, we would ride buses things like that and we just have friends here and there and um, during, through that, you're kind of like downloading all this information, you know, visual information, even the music that you're mm -hmm. listening to, the soundtrack of what my brother was playing in his car when we were driving yeah. to somewhere or wherever, missions and things like that. These are the things we're thinking about and the things that uh, they were speaking about in the music and in, on the walls really was just something that really informed the way I look at the LA landscape. Mm. Um, to this day and um, the people in it also and um, it's also just kind of like it's not like you know I'm still seeing that same way or even listening to the same music I listen to everything now but just everything about that was kind of like the the um, just the, the, the jump off point um, and now it's mm. um, taking everything in the landscape that we don't look at as art or sculpture or things like that and using it to create um, new forms uh, or just, just a new language, a visual vocabulary that already exists in the LA landscape and, and, and flipping it and using it to send messages or to um, evoke feelings of this, this space. Mm -hmm. A lot of these landscapes are creating a third space for me. Um, I have, um, you know, when I was growing up, there was some ambiguity with my, um, you know, my mother and my father and my mother being Filipino and my dad Nat being Native American and Mexican. There was like, um, and the pressure of like, you know, uh, not seeing myself in TV, movies, uh, movie posters, things like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I feel like this, 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 this embracing LA and the landscape in it, the little pockets of LA, the little bridges that connect people, that mm -hmm. is where, really where I live because that's kind of like my experience is just kind of like mm -hmm. seeing people kind of come together like my mom and my dad and also just um, creating a third space for myself. This is what the, these pieces are about and just kind of investigating that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really that's a, a really kind of useful idea of you know coming coming to this uh, idea of a third space. I think that all of your work sort of creates that um, kind of like a a, a uniquely um, I don't know it, it, it's very powerful in that way, uniquely powerful in that you're you're forging um, 
forging uh, a new way for us to, to think about and pay attention to the city that we are living in and, and knowing and, um, and, and thinking about it in, in all these different ways. Um, do you, do you guys think about when you're making this work? I know we're, we're talking about, um, you know, where you come from and how it's grounded, but do you think about who's, who's looking at it and audiences? Um, because I do think that, you know, we all talked about, we talked about this a little bit earlier too. Um, you know, we're, um, having this conversation um, in you know the context of LA Louver and commercial art gallery in Los Angeles that you know has this incredible storied history um, and uh, you know operates in a in a particular um, you know kind of kind of art world really right so um, and your work I think um, you know certainly acknowledges, a really complicated story about art in LA, I think, in, in many ways. Um, so maybe you guys can can talk about your, um, you know, kind of ideas of audience and, and who you're making the work for. And if you think about who you're making the work for when you're making it, yeah. I don't know if anybody wants to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For me, the audience is usually always considered, but First and foremost, it's always the people that I'm painting. If I'm, mm -hmm. you know, painting people, it's always got to be them first because yeah. a lot of the people that I've I've captured, they've never been painted before. They've never been mm. photographed in this sort of artwork for sort of way. So I, that takes a lot of responsibility yeah. you know, for me, and there's there's a lot of gravity in that because. I haven't had it personally, but like I know friends who have sort of had bad experiences when people misuse their image or use it and they don't want them to use it yeah. and then they go make an art piece about it. And like that's a very traumatic experience for them. So for me, like when I hear that, like I free, I'm like, hey, I got to double down on what I'm doing because I know how important it is because I've, I've heard of what that other side is and I don't want my friends to experience that right so for me like at first and foremost it's always the people that i'm capturing because i want them to feel how uh you know how these you know old renaissance people that like, captured with their things and like they have mm -hmm. the, you know all of the the red sort of velvet in the background and like they feel very like proper and like respected i want them to feel that as well mm -hmm. when they see mm -hmm. themselves you know part of you know some of the best stories I have in regards to art and my practice is having my friends come back and see the work and you know one of my friends who's I won't say her name because her name is the title of the painting um, but you know she came to the studio and like saw her work and like just saw this big portrait of herself and just said it and she like, didn't say anything for like five minutes and it was just like wow I didn't know how much I needed to see myself mm. you know and so for me like I I as the artist can never even imagine that that's going to be a response when someone right. sees something that we worked with but now that I know that 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 is a reality you know I have to attend to that right. you know and and that's that's paramount because it all starts there you know whatever happens like with the greater audience if someone's seeing in a gallery or online or digitally I think that experience between me and my friends at the beginning or whoever is being captured has the ripple effects that sort of will go into the rest of the audience. The rest, you know, the rest of the audience is, is obviously, uh, you know, I think about them. I don't want, you know, I don't want to, no one ever wants to piss anybody off. I'm not making work to piss anybody off or do anything like that, but you know, that they're not necessarily the, the thing that's on my mind. My work is not meant to satisfy um, you know, a greater population of people. It's, it's meant to maybe give that, that point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And then once it goes out, then, you know, then everyone can have their flowers, you know. But I, I've definitely, especially in quarantine, mm -hmm. um, have definitely changed my practice a bit. It's definitely like pulled back on the brakes, like pulled out from the brakes a little, just like to, mm -hmm. I guess, put down on the brakes a little, just like in pausing my work in in ways that I can also attend to the work in the way energetically I need to as yeah. opposed to just going to the easel and like just working 
um, because that's very taxing. And I don't, I do a disservice to the artwork that I'm creating if I'm just completely like drained, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm just making the work. Um, because I, 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 I definitely believe that energetically that goes into the work, you know, no matter what I'm giving, like if I wake up and I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm rolling and I'm dying, like that's going to go into the work because my brush is going to move differently. You know, my pen is that everything moves differently when you're in that and you're not like slugging and like, you know, you're just like, you know, dr drowning in it. So that that for me is like that's the audience that I really consider is is the the point A to point B, you know, with with me and my subjects and, you know, same thing like if I'm painting flowers, yeah. you know, the, those have to be attended to, too, you know, they're a living organism you know and so like i'm i'm capturing them in this way and i have to capture them in a way that that shows that i respect them first yeah. you know and that they deserve to be in a, in a big painting and a big artwork and i believe that that's that's the important part um, of the relationships between me and somebody else viewing the works mm -hmm. um and it being a part of the works um that is is paramount to me yeah, yeah. The the power of the the paintings and the work that the paintings do yeah. for the sitters and then for you know all of the rest of the audience. But they're yeah. they're very, um, you know, they're they're impactful and they they move things around them. You know, <laughs> so yeah. in a, in a really kind of wonderful way. Thank you. Um, yeah, and Gabriella, did you did you want to? Yeah. Um. I think a lot about who, I mean, sometimes I think I think I need to like pull back a little bit um, because I'm always considering who is going to see it, where it's going to be seen, in what context, what conversations could happen around it when I'm there and when I'm not there um, yeah. because I'm very protective of, it, of who I paint. Um, I started painting family um, and largely men in my family who had passed and yeah. to be just totally honest men who had records you know and could easily be seen in certain ways um yeah. that we now it's obviously changing with um recent events but you know in the past uh space wasn't meant to talk about um these stories in mixed audiences honestly you know yeah. um that still that i felt like i could still um, uh, carry these memories and stories and um, share them in a way that kept the sentence going even though they had passed you know where like a lot of these men um, the system of criminalization and just uh, low growing up in low economics really um, when a life is lost in those situations or in relation to those situations, it often feels like uh, these larger than life systems really got the last word that they mm. got the period at the end of the sentence. And the work that I really felt like I needed to make just came out, you know, it was a mm. process of my own figuring out how I, it felt important for me to be able to work with images of my family members mm -hmm. um, in a way that honored them, but also in a way that didn't position them as like, this is who they are, you know, you're getting everything, you know everything about them, you, and then leaving room for judgment, you know? That's why I really pair abstraction with um, mm -hmm. my portraiture because mm -hmm. it's a form of protection um, and a form mm -hmm. of continuation because when something's abstracted, it, um, keeps part of it unnameable or untamable and which leaves room for it to always grow in whatever way just as people do you know yeah, yeah. um and and now in my work um i am still doing that i still am trying to create this spectrum of full abstraction to more um realism that never quite that always leaves at least a thin layer of abstraction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so like this image is from a new series um mm. and i felt a lot of um 
pressure with this one because huh. for the series I took, um, I did, I started this during quarantine, obviously. Um, and uh, I thought it was important to photograph family members and friends um, and community members who are currently in my life, you know? So it's also bringing this past and present together um, where usually I had only been using archival photos. Now mm -hmm. um, it's mixing in present with archival. Um, and here you can see me still having a lot of abstraction even, I mean, it's hard to tell because you can never, photos never really show you everything. Mm -hmm. But um, in, this, in this, I had Yaz, that's the woman that's featured. I had her photographed um, with a friend of my, by a friend of mine, um, mm. and she's from El she's from Whittier, born and raised, mm -hmm. um, and we're both a part of a community group together. And um, I told the women for the series that they could dress however they wanted, mm. um, knowing that this was going to be in a gallery setting. Yeah. Um, you know, with that knowledge, and then it was a very casual shoot. There was no backdrop or anything. We, um, you can't see it because I've painted it out, but it was in front of the side of her garage. So there's like a grate on the wall behind her. And in person, you can see some of the stucco wall texture coming through behind the green. Uh -huh. um, but then I really tried to layer it with these forms of protection so that I could have the conversation that I wanted and that I felt like was needed while also not positioning Yaz in a way that left her vulnerable, but at the same time um, left her visible, but with dignity um, mm -hmm. and also in a, in a um, state of empowerment um, mm -hmm. because of this idea of not knowing, I'm not gonna always be with this work, you know? And even mm -hmm. though I write extensively about all the work, and I write on the back who Yaz is. And, um, you know, she ran for city council um, uh -huh. in Whittier and all this kind of stuff, just so there's like some context on the back right. of this fabric that will always be there. Uh -huh. That's uh -huh. one form of protection. But then also this organic shape that is behind her is um, an ink blot uh, test mm. image. So um, from, uh, which is a, psychological projection test where they show you this ink blot and you're supposed to tell them mm -hmm. what you think is happening in this, um, what you see in it. And it's supposed to be a way of evaluating your own mental and emotional state and biases. Mm -hmm. um, and just, so this is done in a way to position her as a form of protection that whatever you read into this mm -hmm. um, isn't really who Yaz is because you don't know Yaz, you know? Mm, um, but that doesn't mean that you still can't um, enjoy this painting or that you can't get something from it. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, there's a lot of coding that if you aren't directly um, connected to the community, you might not pick up on, mm -hmm. but if you are, it's there. Yeah, um, but yeah, also yeah. leaving different access points where it still functions in a fine art capacity. So even if you aren't you don't have um, some of the cultural cues. It still works as a formal art piece. Um, and all of the works in these series really, the text rough image yeah. is this duality where the title is rough slash, it, slash image and then in parentheses, a cropped image of Yaz. So this idea that it's fragmented, you're only seeing a piece and the rough image part in person, you can see that um, mm -hmm she's been edited so the tattoo on her arm is really pixelated and looks glittery mm -hmm. um, and it's of her grandmother and you can see that they look very similar and then in the mm -hmm. corner top left you see um, glitter in the corner that mimics the it's like a metal flake that mimics kind of the same pattern of mm -hmm. um, the tattoo and then the flower on the right becomes this like metaphorical symbol um, for the wider yeah. community that is also pixelated. And so then now Rough Image is talking more about the, um, the mm -hmm. formal qualities of the painting. And so flipping a phrase that has often been used against our community and many mm -hmm. communities in a yeah. way that, um, that gives Yaz um, specifically room to, um, to not be 
compressed by that. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I love your read of this and, and like kind of walking us through it because I think that actually, you know, gets to all of these, you know, questions and issues of, of um, representation and, and audience and who this is for and, and, and who you think about and who's, uh, how, how different people read it, um, you know. Uh, yeah. I think the same as, uh, you know, certainly like with Patrick, with your work, I think, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of really interesting kind of multi-layered uh, perceptions of, of what you're doing, um, you know, in your paintings and the neons and also the cakes we haven't even spoken about yet, which, you know, in terms of representations of people um, and, and portraits and what those, what those, um, uh, you know, how those figures and, and uh, representations um, function in, in your work in very similar ways to, um, you know, Koshin, I think you, you have um, a lot to talk about in terms of the use and the meaning of the images deployed in these artworks, right? I mean, um, yeah, the, the cake pieces were about um, community, aesthetic, uh, you know, they were about celebratory portraits, um, kind of like the flip side of like the Charles School background of some uh, white man that's painted, you know, sitting at the National Portrait Gallery. These are the, the flip of that, you know, um, mm -hmm. gold frame uh, acts as, you know, the, the plate, but it also acts as a frame, mm. the portrait. And these are all people that I feel that are just kind of, you know, even when I was in high school or middle school, they weren't talked about, you know, these are, you know, uh, brown and um, black folks, but just kind of like giving them um, space and kind of like letting them kind of uh, shine. Um, and that, that speaks to like, you know, just even like um, the concept of like, you know, uh, what, I, what I was talking about earlier was just like, I come kind of like from this like kind of, uh, pretty good start, but then it became like very hectic, you know, in the, in the 90s. And um, mm. it was a lot of like hopelessness, you know, during that time when I was a teenager and kind of, uh, I don't know, just just kind of like, if, if there was like nothing to really cele celebrate and mm -hmm. choosing hope and kind of like wanting to be part of something bigger and getting past the dated conversation of like, that's just the way it's gonna be or, you know, yeah this is where this stuff comes from and it and it comes from like putting and pa painting these people into importance and then putting them into a show putting them into wherever or if i yeah. need to put them in um, on instagram or whatever right like just like well who is that what what did they do um i didn't see these people in my history books so not a lot of them you know so th this is why like it's an ongoing series and i kind of like even um, I get to research a little bit and sometimes I run into a story. Sometimes I've known about a person and yeah. I want to meet them for a while. Um, and uh, like Koshin said, uh, painting portraits are very exhausting. You know, it's, yeah. um, you want to do it right. And I think that I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting, you know, adjusting, um, you know, I'm learning a lot. So I'm, I'm painting and, um, you know, during, during quarantine is definitely the time when we want to paint portraits because you can really pay attention to every single thing, you know, and <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it, it becomes, uh, it definitely becomes taxing. Yeah. But, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's wanting to, to give them that light and give them that, that uh, do. It's the way, it's a way of honoring them, right? Like, yeah. It's just like a, a real, like, um, tangible, uh, way of way of honoring people and, and spending time and care, um, you know, kind of amplifying their lives, right? So like this as well. Yeah, and it also comes from like me being want me wanting to become, you know, to, to be useful in a way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So this person um, or or bring light to this person or the situation. And it's and I guess that's why I kind of bridge um, this type of work to community because it isn't you know a lot of the work comes from the community and it's in, it's informed by that and mm -hmm. but also taking this art that you see here and turning it into a print and then injecting it back into the community somehow is 
something that I kind of look for. Like, you know, the, these are opportunities that I kind of want to um, create and uh, get back to uh, people that can actually see it or people that can see that uh, mm -hmm. hopefully that some of the narrative is being talked about or seen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it all it all is kind of, you know, maybe we can bring this uh, conversation back to the idea of, of, you know, kind of thinking about a future and um, hopefully a more hopeful future. Um, where you all see, um, you know, how, how your work kind of plays into an idea of, of a different kind of LA in the future and um, uh, a kind of um, a way that your work can, can point to different, different futures, I guess. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody wants to talk about, talk about that. It's a, it's probably too big of a question really, but um, you know, just uh, what your hopes and dreams are basically for LA as moving forward mm -hmm. and for, you know, your work and how you, how you like your work, how you think about your work in that context. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think in history, the how the world sort of wants to be seen is usually led by the art, right, and the mm -hmm. artist, and that's usually how it's captured and portrayed in murals or, you know, just in art in general and books and movies and things like that, um, a vision for the future. Oh. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's that's what I'm doing with my work, you know, and quarantine has been great because... Mm -hmm it's allowed me that time to be able to like really sit with my practice and like, okay, what are you doing? You know, yeah. what is, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen next week with the pandemic and just everything that's sort of going on, but like, what are you going to do today? Um, what is the art that you're going to plan? What are you going to show the world? What are you going to, how are you going to participate? Um, and what are you going to create, you know? And so for me, that's the work that I'm making, you know, where it's based out of positivity, based out of, you know, love and connection. Um, Cause that's what, that's what we need, you know, similar to like, I think everybody here, everybody's here is work ba is based in community, you know, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate. The unfortunate part about being in a pandemic and a quarantine is that like, I don't get to like see my friends and connect with them and be inspired as I used to. So I had to sort of, modify how I was, you know, able to get the inspiration and tell stories and, my, you know, modify how you're connecting with your friends and people, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think especially in our, you know, since we're all sort of, me specifically, since I'm talking for myself, right? Uh, you know, in how I'm, you know, portraying my vision and how I'm capturing my friends, mm -hmm. um, it makes it even that much more important. You know, I think for people to see that community, community can still exist, like you can still make artworks that portray uh, a, a bright, lighter future. Um, mm -hmm. that, you know, the future doesn't have to be like dark and it doesn't have to be portrayed that way in art. Um, you know, you could still make a romantic comedy in a pandemic, <laughs> you know, like you could still make an art that, that looks like this and that gives you this feeling. Mm -hmm. um, even in these, you know, trying times and this climate and all these, you know, all these sort of hot words that people like to use, you could still give them this. And so for me, uh, that's, that's my vision, you know, is mm -hmm. to continue to still show that, that all of these things are possible and that you can still do them because, you know, someone is doing them, I'm, you know, doing them. So, you know, you can do them too. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be like a 1984 Blade Runner sort of thing. Like, you know, like that's, it can, it can be something, it can be lighter, it can be you bright. Can make it, it something still, else, yeah. Yeah, it could still be connected. Um, yeah. You just sort of have to sort of change maybe a little what that looks like, and then you could see it. Mm -hmm. And Gajin, how about you? Um, futurism, yeah. I, yeah. I can't pick <laughs> what's going to happen in the near future. I was just going to get back to, um, mm. you know, who I make my um, yeah. work for. Yeah. You know, uh, first and foremost, I think I make my work for myself, mm -hmm. you know, because this is something that I want to see. This is something original. And then talking about futurism, 
I think I'm making work for the future people. I want to see the reactions of I would I would love to see the reactions of people that live 500 years from now. Uh-huh. You know, or even 100 years from now when um cuz I think ultimately in art we're all striving to leave a mark, leave a record of humankind, right? Uh -huh. Um and so that's what I, you know, I feel like I'm I'm making work for uh people in the future. Uh -huh. um, and hopefully my work can resonate and be relevant even a hundred years from now. Um, and and people will look back and and look at my work and 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 you know, I mean, I'll be long gone and it doesn't it wouldn't matter but um it would be kind of interesting and and curious to see what kind of reaction you get maybe a hundred years from now um and how people uh -huh. uh, critique your work you know um what they read what they see how they and um i had like an I just recently was talking to a good friend of mine and he's struggling with addiction. And this is like a, a pulp fiction story. So, he, you know, he's struggling with addiction. And um, so he's at a crack house, right? Scoring crack or whatever. He knows, you know, this is like in South Central and uh, he knows this older, uh, neighborhood guy from from the streets um that's kind of like tending the door to the crack house he said he was about 60 years old this guy's name was sea dog he said um sea dog all of a sudden has like uh he faints he he uh he had like a heart um heart attack or like a stroke or something and he was laying on the floor in this room and so my friend, um, cause nobody cared. My friend um, was concerned and he, he went and um, see if he was all right. Uh -huh. And he was laying there, he said, and uh, he checked for his pulse and his, his breath. And he, he like uh, told everybody like, dude, this dude isn't breathing, man. Uh -huh. Um, and then nobody cared because everybody was just too busy, like, you know, getting high. <laughs> and um, my friend decided to to perform like CPR on him to save him. Uh -huh. um, and while he was performing CPR and, you know, I think he called the ambulance as well. Uh, they, he was able to resuscitate him long enough for the for the ambulance to get there. Yeah. And, while they were like lifting up it, lifting up Sea Dog into the gurney, um, he said he saw his keychain dangling off of his, off the side of his pants, and um, on the keychain was the image, my image of the library card. He had like a uh -huh. a library card uh, keychain thing that uh -huh. had my image on it. And I was like, wow, that's fucking crazy, man. Mm -hmm. And that story, because yeah. he was saying, you know, this guy, Sea Dog, you wouldn't even catch him at a library. You know, he's not gonna read, he's not gonna be reading books, you know, or he's not gonna go yeah. like, you know, frequenting the library, but he he, he had your he had your painting in his pocket. Yeah, he right? had my, he had the image. He liked it so much, you know. Um, I guess that he he somehow got it, and uh, I was like, "Wow, that's like that's crazy." Yeah. Uh, I thought that was like a real good story, you know. So that um, was was it like last year or the year before last? Yeah, that you, last year. Uh, yeah, he, uh, Gajin made. Um, a, a really oh, the, amazing the library design. card came up yeah, yeah last yeah he made an amazing design for uh, an la public library card oh there it is there we go <laughs> i 
<laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was 29 Christina. Yeah. two years ago now. Yeah. yeah. Um, Almost. And, you know, in terms of the way your work is, uh, the way art circulates, you know, um, virtually and reality, um, you know, on Instagram and as a library card. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's kind of an amazing. Um... It's you know to me, I I was uh, I was like a huge compliment because it mm -hmm. my work was able to infiltrate all levels of society. You know, mm -hmm. um, that's what I what I want, and that's what I'm hoping for in the future. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well. Um, should we uh, try to open it up just in case there's, I know we're, we're kind of. Yes, we're running would want to jump <laughs> in if possible. Late. Please, Gabriella, <laughs> please do. Um, yeah. Just about the vision for the future, because I think it's yeah. an, um, important too of like, off of what Gajin was just saying, I think um, like really connecting um, like my, specifically like how art relates to this um, and the future of LA of just um, being a vehicle of connection between communities who um, have shared histories, even if it's just that uh, you live and work in LA um, and really um, giving more voice to that. But on a deeper level, I will just be completely honest that I'm very interested in how um, new economic models within the art world specifically, since that's what we're talking, yeah. the context that we're speaking in now, how uh, new economic models and business models can shift and should and will shift, hopefully, mm -hmm. um, because of these recent conversations, thinking about practices um, that galleries and large institutions do, especially now as there's more artists um, who, non-white artists coming into the art world and sharing narratives that are often marginalized until um, recently within the art world specifically. And so thinking yeah. about if you're bringing in com communities who are usually from low economic status, what business as usual do you need to shift to be able to support <laughs> these artists and these communities? Um, is it the practice of not requiring artists to fully pay for production for the first solo show they have, stuff like that. That is often um, regular practice. Um, and there's many more, but, um, and I think also thinking about how the relationship with collectors and institutes who um, do support us, um, how we can really be vehicles of wealth redistribution, honestly, um, how we can, um, you know, if a collector is buying these works, let's build relationships where um, it's connected to, directly connected to ideas of, you know, like the mutual aid funds that are popping up where it's um, money being directly given to people who are in need um, and how art can often be I see a potential for art being a vehicle for discussions like this because mm -hmm. it is so tied to um, it's a it's a fine art world, but it's still a commercial world. It's still a business. Um, it still has its own economic models. And if we do really want to um, to protect LA to help it mm -hmm. flourish, to help our own communities, what ways can we not only be discussion starters, but mm -hmm. also um, pair it with real economic exchange, direct economic um, flow into communities who need it through, especially now as a lot of real estate is being bought up during this time and thinking about yeah. who, if you're a collector who, an institute who's supporting us, how do you, um, what, businesses do you want to partner with in the future who you're going to yep. support stuff like that yeah no i mean those are real like the the real like tangible questions that have come up and and are you know so like kind of present and front of mind and because you know because of all of the you know collapse that we see around us it's like 
okay, now there's a chance. Let's, let's really think about how to, because it's unmade at this point, like how to remake something that is more, um, you know, uh, kind of sust like, you know, to use a, a overused word, but really like sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. For, for all of the people who like you, mm -hmm. all the artists that are, um, you know, whose, whose vision and, um, you know, basically whose vision that we're relying on, that we are, we're looking to, right? So, um, yeah, I, that's an incredible point, I think, absolutely. Um, let's see, I wonder how, how are we doing on time? And, oops. Uh, Lisa, I think you're on you're mute. muted. Sorry, we have about 10 minutes left for our extended conversation. Thanks for everybody who's been hanging out. I think yeah. I think the one person we didn't hear about in this round of talking about the future of LA mm -hmm. um, is Patrick. Yeah. Um, and thank you, Gabby, for um, for your contribution, because we did have one question in the QA, uh, Q&A that was asking about legacies of power. Um, as we grapple with this moment as a community and a nation, LA is mm -hmm. so celebrated for its diversity, but it is also highly unequal and socially striated region. Realizing this is a broad question, how can we move away from empty lip service and more directly into social and cultural transformation through art? I think Gabby yeah. really, um, Gabriella really Absolutely. kind of spoke to that, but maybe Patrick, do you want to wrap up sort of um, the conversation about the future relative to this question? Um, yeah, I, I was just thinking about um, like the work that um, a lot of us are making or the work that we want, the language that we want to see out there where we're, we're um, visually kind of like uh, creating these objects, right? Um, and, and placing them for like, for me, it's like neon um, signage that I'm working with uh, comes from mom and pop advertising. And mm -hmm. they started out as um, warning signs almost, right? And, and, mm -hmm. and uh, reminders uh, during like, you know, uh, the current administration's first couple of years, even before that I was making that work. Um, and now like I'm switching because the language is changing and I, I want it to change, you know, I want it to be more about um, a call to action or okay. things kind of like look for in terms of the language that we, we kind of um, digest. So um, just just speaking from 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 me it's just kind of like building bridges to the people we're talking to and, and not, I guess, um, you know, just, just doing, um, you know, our shows and just, you know, hoping that they come, but, you know, um, creating projects that uh, involve them. Um, and, um, you know, art is very um, elite, um, you know, and it's also very expensive, people think, and um, to enjoy it, you need to, you know, uh, be some type of high class person or an elite or some type of, uh, person like that. And uh, my, my thing is to build bridges to kind of get people the work. Um, and then on top of that, even like, hopefully even like what Gabby was saying was even like, you know, getting them a piece of work or, you know what I mean? Like older pieces, like giving them, you know, giving a piece to my brother, or like, you know, like, but that's like another conversation, but even, um, um, I was thinking about just like getting this work out and, um, you know, kind of like uh, creating um, a shift in the language that we're seeing and, and, and the things that we're digesting. And, and speaking to, um, you know, just straightforward love and compassion. And, and, and I know that there's other conversations to be had that, that are um, more kind of angry and, um, but, you know, we could have those conversations too, but, um, you know, speaking more to, to um, you know, not this winning culture that we've been kind of digesting, but just kind of, um, you know, aligning ourselves with like um, more of a com compassion that we really need that. And um, um, I don't know, I think that, uh, you know, like the last four years, I mean, it's to, to me, I don't think it was a very, um, it wasn't really a surprise to me, you know, that he became, you know, that this guy became president because it's a direct reflection of what we're, we're kind of looking like a very self-centered country. And we just, you know, think about ourselves and some and money, you know, not a lot of people think like that. They want just to live and, you know, 
mm-hmm. you know, dignity and, you know, have an opportunity at love. Um, some people want that, that's fine. Um, but I don't know, it's, it's just that conversation, you know, it's just um, getting to that conversation of like, um, hey, cool, money doesn't really make you happy all the way. I mean, it's a component maybe for some people, but um, what is, what is the, uh, the rest of the conversation? Like what, what else can we speak about? And I'm trying to do that, um, you know, visually when I have the chance. So those are things that I'm working on continuing on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you all of you. I have one more. I know that, you know, today has been a really, this week has been a really tough week. Today is a really tough day. We're appreciative to all of you for both the panelists and the audience for your attention today, even as the events in Washington DC, DC right now are deserving of our scrutiny as as um, citizens of this country and of the world, but I kind of wanted to leave it on one more note, grounding us in Los Angeles. And I was hoping we could just do a quick speed round with all of you native Los Angelinos. Um, okay, quickly for each of you, um, name your favorite natural or architectural landmark, cultural destination and res- or restaurant in Los Angeles. I'll start with uh, Gabriela. Oh my God, okay. Um, I'm just gonna say, my mom's house (laughs) that is like where we spend like that's where I have the best memories and we moved all the time so it's just wherever my mom lives potion you said a cultural landmark cultural landmark a natural or architectural landmark or restaurant or I mean I'd have to say Ron Finley's gangsta garden in in south central (laughs) (laughs) um I would just have to say, I mean, there's no competition. You can't, you can't even put anything else in the ring. That has to be it. I'm done. Very good. Gajin? Uh, for me, it has to be the Pacific Coast, um, the natural, natural landmark. I, I think um, a lot of us uh, children of uh, em- immigrant people that came from, came in through the West, I think were drawn by the Pacific Ocean. So for me, it's like the Pacific Ocean. And Patrick? Um, I guess it used to be Sixth Street Bridge and then the skyline, but um, you can't really drive across that right now. So <laughs> um, I, I ride there like twice, three times a week, uh, LA River. LA River and and it's weird because it has a weird mixture of concrete and nature so it's like water trees concrete tags uh barbed wire fences dirt uh, nature so it has it all really and Chris we have to ask you too good one um I would say um just uh, because I've been thinking about this a bit but you know Evergreen Cemetery in Boyle Heights so that (laughs) yeah right so okay my because my um my dad's side of the family quite a few uh, relatives are buried there and it's just it's like this incredible um you know cemeteries are really telling places right just in terms of of urban history and and you know community histories and and that is one of the oldest one of the rich like the deepest like it's it's um there's a lot of stories there that remind me of the the city in good ways and bad ways right so well thanks again i'd like to thank all of you guys um our fantastic panel of artists koshin finley gajin fujita patrick martinez gabriela sanchez and our moderator chris kermitsu thank you so much for being involved in this conversation today um, just a note to all of our audience we have recorded this conversation and we will upload it in the next couple of days so you can revisit it and share it with others And if you've missed any of the programs for 45 at 45, I do encourage you to check out our archive online at lalouver.com, LA Louver's YouTube channel, and also our Instagram features now archived on IGTV. We will also be launching a new online viewing room titled Palimpsest that will spotlight works in our 45 at 45 show, including some of these artists. So please check this out starting tomorrow on our website. And finally, I don't mean to keep you captive for much longer, but I have a personal message on behalf of the gallery. For the last 10 years, all of us at LA Louvre have had the incredible pleasure of working alongside Christina Carlos, the gallery's communications manager. She's been the woman behind the curtain of all of LA Louvre's media. She's been the gallery's voice, conscience, and heart. 
steering our publications, press, branding, and social media, and has pushed us into the realm of creativity and conversation that none of us could have possibly imagined. We owe a debt of ingratitude to Christina, who's behind the curtain right now. She's one of the most extraordinary people I've known, whose intelligence, humor, humanity, and spirit have kept us buoyed in our work, and particularly through the unprecedented challenges of this last year. And although we are all sad that this is her last week with L.A. Louver, I and my colleagues celebrate her and her undoubtedly important and amazing things she will contribute to the world up ahead. Thank you, Cece, for everything you've done and will continue to do so. And with that, thank you all for joining us today. Please stay well and be good to each other. Likewise. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye, everybody. Bye.